I think, I think therefore, I'm constantly trying to improve myself. I'm a human being. I happen to be a humanist. I love it when I meet a fellow humanist. And I'm not a robot. Although this humanist knows a f Yeah, yeah. This humanist knows something about robots. Um, Dr. Vivian Ming. Why, Vivian? We traffic in secretaries of state and defense like Baker and Hegel and whatnot. Uh, I was at a conference this summer at USC where I was speaking about supply chains for some reason and, and uh, at the Marshall School of Business and I decided to poll my conferees and say, who's good here? She wasn't here. Who is the best speaker you've heard in the past year? Two people said, go to LinkedIn, find the mad scientist named Vivian Ming. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm down with it. Turns out, <clears throat> Vivian's cool. She writes a lot of books, among other things. She makes things, she creates things, she's going to explore you. Um, she writes a lot of books and she has two uh, romantic comedy screenplays. Yeah, about brains. And she has, among other things, developed an AI to treat her son's diabetes, which is pretty damn amazing. We're going to hear about it. Dr. Vivian Ming. Thank you. It was great. I was going to do some Dean Martin tunes. I was going to tell a dirty story about a trout, a flounder, and an alarm clock, and you ruined the whole thing, so I'll have to go somewhere else. Um, I am now wondering what a dirty story involving a trout and flounder or an alarm clock would be, but it'd probably be not appropriate for this room. Somewhere in the White House, maybe, but not this room. Um, so. I, uh, if you do look me up on LinkedIn, it does say professional mad scientist. I, I, it's not meaning to be uh, jokey about it, I just didn't know how to describe myself uh, in any other terms. I'm proud of being mad. I am, despite having founded a number of companies, I am, I think, fundamentally a scientist. Um, it explains how I engage with the world. And while I can't do any of my uh, D. Martin impressions at this point, I can share stories because it turns out when I was in grad school, my advisor shared with me the advice that he'd gotten from his advisor. Uh, and it was that science should be a story. And that story should be about an hour long. We're gonna aim for slightly less than that here. I've been known to go for more, so you are forewarned if you do not stop me the weeping, the tears, the begging, it will not help you. Um, I, I like to tell the whole story. Uh, but let me start with this one, uh, because it was set in November as well. Um, in 2011, my wife and I, uh, our young son who had just turned four and a new baby, and it is the Sunday before Thanksgiving holiday. And my son throws up in the bath, which is not a big deal, right? Everyone here, probably many of you have kids. They catch things all the time. They're just vomit and stuff coming out of them. It's just, it's being a parent. Um, uh, all the more so if you're a mad scientist and you have been known to occasionally run experiments on your kids. So um, this happens, and we don't sweat it. My dad was a doctor. I'm, I'm the kind of person that never takes medicine, like a lot of uh, uh, kids of doctors. Um, so um, I, but you know, we're thoughtful. Call the pediatrician, just let him know. And they say, eh, it's probably just the flu. And then it's Monday and he's not really better. And then it seems like he's better. And then it seems like he's worse. And then it's Wednesday and he can't stand up. He'd lost about 25 pounds off a 40 pound frame. Um, fast, like all of this happened, so fast. And again, the whole time we've been in contact with the pediatrician, um, and they said, uh, you know, this is strange. This doesn't sound like, you know, the flu anymore. So bring him in, and like, you know, this is the end of the day on Wednesday. We're running into a four-day weekend. 
if we don't do something now, uh, so we go to the pediatrician's office, they didn't even need to run a test. Uh, they could do it just from smell. So if you're a doctor in the room, I bet you can guess what it is already. It's diabetes, you just heard. They could smell, the sweat was so sweet from all the sugar in it. So type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle is, it doesn't matter whether you exercise or diet right, although that is an important part of everyone's life. Uh, your body destroys the cells that make insulin. Without insulin, you can eat as much as you want. The sugar just builds up in your bloodstream and you starve to death. Why did he lose 25 pounds? Because his body was eating itself. That's what happens when it gets advanced. It starts breaking down the muscle and turning that into energy, which unfortunately turns your blood acidic. And uh, you know, you're probably more familiar with the idea of blood sugars being low and being dangerous and sending you to the emergency room. Well, when the blood sugar's off the charts high, terrible other things happen. So that started for me the worst 24 hours of my life. Uh, we went to Oakland Children's Hospital and we spent 24 hours uh, in the pediatric intensive care unit with, I had a cot next to his bed. And you can probably imagine if you've never been to one of these, they're pretty busy and well lit. So for 24 hours, at the top and bottom of every hour, so half hour cycles, they'd wake him up. Needles, uh, injections, you can't just fill his body full of insulin because at that height, the shock will kill him. So that they slowly titrate down his blood glucose levels over 24 hours. Um, and then for an hour, 10 minutes, he's delirious, flailing around, and I'm there to get him back. And then I get 10 minutes on the cot, and then it starts all over again. So that was a hard four days there at Oakland Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Um, we got to leave as a whole family, so that gives you perspective. Uh, there were plenty of families there that clearly were never going to get to leave together. Uh, so I don't shed any special tears for me. Plenty of people have terrible things happen, even to their kids, and you move along because there's nothing else you can do than move along. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that wasn't the biggest shock of the entire experience. The biggest shock for me came about a month later. See, my wife and I are both scientists. Uh, she's not as mad as I am, but she's still a weirdo because she's a scientist. Um, you know, we're the kinds of people that when your son is diagnosed with a disease, you start recording everything, right? This is science. We just ran an experiment. In fact, we have a, a Google spreadsheet, um, the first line of which is goose, 89 grams. Mashed potato, 189 grams. That's the Thanksgiving meal we'd missed because we were in the hospital, and instead we had it his first night home. And that was everything he ate to the gram for the next month of his life. All of his blood glucose levels. Did he have the sniffles? What was his heart rate? How many steps did he take? I wired my son up and I collected everything. And before that outpatient visit, I sent it in an email to his endocrinologist, thinking they're gonna love me. Um, yeah, I know, I'm in the future with you also now. So, um, no, uh, they got no response at all. It was truly mystifying. Doesn't everybody love having thousands and thousands of data points? Um, you know, this is pillow talk for my wife and I. We get together and talk about statistical models of intra-school inequality. I mean, that gets me going. Um, so um, we're collecting all this, and then I realized what it was. So before we went in for that first outpatient visit, I printed up about an inch thick of spreadsheet, and we brought it in with us and like dropped it like the phone book. Boy, that's a reference that a room of 16-year-olds won't get anymore. Um, I thought it was disturbing when people didn't get my Gilligan's Island references anymore, and then they didn't get my Seinfeld references, and now I just tell them to, I've, I've had enough of young people, how dare they be healthy and beautiful. Um, so, uh, so I bring this in with me and they're angry with me. Angry for wasting their time. What am I supposed to do with this data? Which by the way, as you're about to learn as we go through the evening, uh, anyone that says something like that in the course of their work, your job is not long for this world. 
Um, but I'm sympathetic. Uh, so instead of the literally thousands and thousands of data points we collected about my son, they gave us a photocopied sheet of paper and they had us write down 15 numbers, five days, morning, uh, lunch, evening. 15 blood glucose readings, 15 sugar levels. Uh, kind of just pick the 15 that you want, write them down. Then they eyeballed that sheet of paper, the, the doctor and the head nurse, uh, for several minutes. I'm a huge respect for expertise. The ability to look at a handful of numbers and come up with a prognosis and a plan is amazing. But I happen to be someone that works in machine learning, artificial intelligence. I'll explain more in a bit. But I'm going to be bluntly honest with you. I said to myself, you have got to be fucking kidding me. I build models of the brain. Uh, are you telling me diabetes is more complex than the brain? That you can only do it with numbers and eyeballs? That's crazy. So that night, uh, my wife and I bought a book on uh, endocrinology. I mean, yeah, I took an endocrinology, neuroendocrinology course in, in school, but I slept through most of it. Um, it. If any of you happen to be neuroscientists, that was a circadian rhythm joke. Um, uh, Soy scientists don't make great comedians. Um, so, uh, PGO waves. Pum pum. Uh, so, I, um, we got that book that night, and the next morning, uh, I built this system called Jitterbug. My wife and I started dating doing ballroom dancing, so all of my projects start out with a ballroom dance name, so Jitterbug. Um, so what was Jitterbug? I hacked all of the devices on my son, his insulin pump, his continuous glucose monitor gives you sort of an estimated blood glucose level every five minutes. Uh, he had a smart watch, um, you know, a Fitbit, this sort of thing. I hacked all that stuff. Turns out I broke all sorts of US federal laws. Um, <laughs> you're not supposed to hack medical equipment. But again, this was insane that the state of the art was people staring at numbers. So I hacked all this stuff and I built the first ever AI to treat diabetes. And I used it on my son, because you can do whatever the hell you want to to your own kids. Um, and uh, we built this system, and it was transformative. Uh, we could predict um, an hour, three hours into the future what his blood glucose levels would be. So imagine you're at a party, a very, very fancy party. And um, uh, it's the kind of party where they have uh, well, let me just cut to the chase. It was a party at the White House, and this was many years ago. Uh, strangely enough, my invitations have dried up over the last several years. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure they just got lost in the mail. So, uh, so I was at this uh, very swanky party over there, and they had a really good party. So the first thing my wife and I do is we march right over to the hors d'oeuvre table and start loading up our purses, because there's no reason the party has to end when you leave. Um, so we're, we're doing all this stuff. And this guy, like this enormous, like this size of the table guy with the little curly cue thing coming out of his ear walks up to us. And I think, shit, we're busted. <laughs> um, but he simply says, is that Google Glass you're wearing? And I realize, oh yeah, sure, I'd asked permission. And I really had asked permission. If you don't remember what Google Glass was, it's essentially a wearable computer with a live camera on it, Mine was fluorescent blue. So yes, I went to a black tie dinner at the White House wearing a fluorescent blue computer on my face. Um, and he walks up and he says, is that Google Glass? And I said, yes. Does it take photos? Yes. And does it do video? And I'm like, does he want me to hook him up? What is this about? And then he simply says, please don't live stream the president. He says, geez, I wish TSA worked that way. Um, so sure, of course not. Uh, the president and the vice president were there at the time, and I get it. Um, interesting guy. I have the, the, uh, Joe Biden has the biggest, whitest teeth of any human being I've ever met. Um, very nice guy, but honestly, it's like you want to put a sugar cube out and hold it. Uh, um, and uh, so I meet him. and. And essentially what I didn't know at the time, and again, I swear I asked permission about wearing this thing on my head for reasons you will learn in just a moment, but it apparently didn't get through all levels of security. And so they spent five minutes 
of time deciding whether to kick me out of the White House. I bet Google would have loved it if I'd been kicked out, a lot of news, but instead, the boss wanted to meet me. So my wife and I were just sitting there and this guy dressed up like Lord Nelson or something walks up to us and just says, take one step back, stay right here. So, I mean, what else is gonna happen? So we take one step back, we look up, the Secret Service is pushing everyone else away, little door pops open, bam, President Obama's right in front of me. And I thought, well, gosh, I really want to impress him. So I said, okay, Glass, take a picture. Because <laughs> his voice activated. So it turns out that did not improve his opinion of me. Um, he literally just stares at me and shakes his head like, Jesus, lady, this is my party, and you got this thing on your face? Um, uh, but then I got to say why I was actually wearing it. Because a half an hour before that, I got in a little message, which popped right up in my display, and it told me that my son's blood glucose levels will go low in the next half hour. So I sent a text message to my sister back in San Francisco, who was taking care of him. She gave him some crackers, and he didn't go low. Uh, that's a superpower. You want people to wear a fluorescent blue computer on their face? Give them a superpower. Anyone here is a parent? I wish for you the opportunity to be, to be the one person in the world that could truly solve the unique problem that your child has. It is the most wonderful feeling. Even though I didn't get to cure diabetes, building this thing that transformed our experience of this disease was wonderful. And I thought, I want to share it with everyone. Now, it turns out I'm the fake kind of doctor, twice over again, but we don't get to give medical advice. And I, uh, unambiguous, my stuff is medical advice. Uh, so instead, I simply got on the phone with every device maker that would take my calls, and I told them exactly how to build it. No patent, no strings attached, nothing. This is how you do it. Uh, the coolest version of this, I believe Eli Lilly, uh, the last time I visited uh, there, uh, not KC, but Indianapolis, uh, their head of research and um, their CIO took me in and met this young man that was taking our predictive models, built it into a closed loop insulin pump with deep neural networks. It worked better than the real thing. Now, that is not in the market yet. It's, I don't even know if it's hit human trials yet. But isn't that amazing to be able to build something that could not only transform a terrible life-threatening disease, but completely transform it? Maybe to the point that you have to wonder if I have a family history of type 2 diabetes. Do I just get a prophylactic artificial pancreas? The way someone might get a prophylactic mastectomy. If we do allow that, do people that have these get to compete in the Olympics? Because they will have an advantage. I get to do this amazing thing with my life, which is be a mad scientist. It's to come up with crazed solutions to real problems. Uh, I started my career as a theoretical neuroscientist. Uh, if you've never heard of theoretical neuroscience, just substitute the word lazy for theoretical, and you probably have a pretty good sense. We build machine learning models to try and study the brain, and then we study the brain to come up with better machine learning. So everyone in the world seemingly knows at least a little bit about AI today because it's become this big issue. And in fact, a big part of my life is coming and giving briefings to the UN and the Red Cross and a variety of governments and militaries about it. Um, uh, and see if I can help, but my brand of help is not always what everyone wants. Um, artificial intelligence is any autonomous system that can make decisions under uncertainty. The kind of decisions that only we could make before. How fast should this car be going as it makes a left turn? Uh, this resume, should I bring this person in for an interview? I'm playing Go, what's the next best move? There's no absolute right answers to any of those questions. There's just sort of best, least wrong answers. Uh, and again, is this person happy or sad? Their face. These are pretty fundamentally human questions. The very first project I ever got to work on in this space was doing real-time lie detection off of raw videos of faces for the CIA. Now, it's a little morally vague, um, particularly if you give a talk in a country that has been previously overthrown by the CIA. 
Um, in our case, it was just an academic uh, project sponsored by them looking at whether you could actually do this. And you could, and it was amazing because I could make a system that could see a smile. And that's kind of amazing. Like, I got hooked. I thought I was going to stick wires into cat brains for the rest of my life. And instead, I could build this thing. And it could learn something about happiness. But of course, that's scary also. By the way, side note, that lab, that undergraduate lab, um, you know, $50 million in CA funding and dozens of dissertations to make it all work, spun off as a startup, I struggled for a few years, because cool as it seems, expression recognition as a product is a little vague. Um, and then they had this very clever idea. I think it was like early 2015, uh, during one of the early Republican presidential debates, when there was like 97 people on stage and everyone wants to know whether Ted Cruz actually has human emotions. Um, <laughs> they did a simulcast, he may be a perfectly fine guy, but I gotta admit, it maybe it was Trent Lott that in an interview once was asked by a reporter, uh, why is it that people instantly dislike Ted Cruz? And the head of his own party immediately responds, saves time. Um, <laughs> wow, that's brutal. Um, so, uh, so, so they actually did a simulcast, I think on YouTube, while it was being broadcast by the networks, they did a simulcast where they did expression recognition in real time of all of the candidates. And the bidding war started the next day between Facebook and Apple. So if you have an iPhone, anyone here, uh, and you know you can uh, unlock it with your face or you can do these emojis so you can sort of talk to your phone and it will like animate a cat on someone else's phone exactly the same way. That's my undergraduate lab. Uh, we, yes. Um, next time, rethink your life priorities, applaud for diabetes rather than animated cats on phones. But you have identified my number one rule of innovation, which is, in the end, it animates cats on the internet. That's it. Uh, $50 million of CIA funding, that's what it amounts to. Um, but, you know, to have been involved in that, and now for facial recognition systems to be used in some highly questionable ways. Algorithms that I helped develop. Uh, I also happened to found one of the first companies ever using AI in hiring. Uh, now there's a company out there that is claiming that they can do facial recognition on people during a hiring interview to improve, to take bias out of the process and improve your hiring. So, Interesting side notes, one, interviews are not predictive. You may not know that, but uh, your HR team probably doesn't want to let you know that how most they spend their time actually predicts nothing about whether someone's any good at their job. Um, but I will tell you, as someone uh, who happens to be a world expert in both domains, boy, that's a lot of crap. Um, AI is really interesting. I was trying to think where I might take this to a, a group of policy wonks um, or aficionados or however you self-describe. Um, we could talk about people or we can talk about machines because I have this weird career where I get to work with both. In fact, for me, the machines are purely in service of the people. In fact, when I say I work in AI, what I mean is I work on augmented intelligence. I'm only interested in making better people. I've gotten some pretty swanky job offers in my life to be the chief scientist for Uber. Took about three seconds to say, hell no. <laughs> um, I can actually tell you, literally at this point, that even with the poor performance of their stock, you could not pay me $10 million to be alone in a room with Travis Kalanick. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, you're director of algorithms at Netflix. I love movies. Uh, in fact, I'm working on a few now that my life has gotten really strange. Um, probably strangest is that one of those movies involves Disney and Darren Aronofsky. Uh, I've yet to figure out how that's gonna work out, but as long as insurance companies don't figure it out, we're gonna make a movie. So, um, so uh, I get to, to work on these two sides, and, and I love movies, but I don't wanna spend the rest of my life making movie recommendations to people. 
um, what I get to do after having been an academic, and I love science, I still do it, I'm still a scientist. Having started several companies, been a chief scientist at a few more, I will freely admit I don't love running companies. I, I love solving problems, and then I hire grown-ups to run the companies, because I should not be in charge of anything. Um, uh, I decided to do something different, and I was trying to figure out what it is, and someone said, you know all those projects you do, like the one you did for your son? Uh, the one where you built a system that could predict manic episodes and bipolar sufferers three weeks before they happened. Um, what if you just did that? What if you built a think tank and you solved these sorts of problems? And then, to paraphrase a South African friend of mine, you charged them like a wounded buffalo. Um, <laughs> So it turns out I was really never good at that second part. So I thought, I have an even better business pitch for you. We take the problems and we solve them, and then we give them away. How, wouldn't that be the coolest business ever? And they mentioned this whole revenue concept, <laughs> and I thought, that's, that's, that's you know business school orthodoxy. No, we're going beyond revenue. I'm a Silicon Valley person, right? It's, it's, there's something more. No, uh, my life's been good to me, and so I get to sort of play house. People bring us problems. Dr. Ming, my daughter has 500 seizures a day. Please save her life. Dr. Ming, uh, my son, this is the kookiest one recently, my son can't enter REM sleep. It's maybe half a dozen people in the whole world. My son can't enter REM sleep. If he can't, he's gonna die. Uh, he lives in Cambridge, I mean, he's got Harvard, and MIT right there, surely someone can help, but as of yet, no one can. Um, Dr. Ming, our company can't retain women. Dr. Ming, help us price the actual cost of our bad promotion practices. I won't tell you what those companies are. Uh, or, as I alluded to earlier, uh, Dr. Ming, advise us about ethical AI. Advise our country or our NGO. Um, and, you know, even the Pentagon. Uh, as long as they're comfortable that I'm going to say what I truly believe, uh, then, of course, I'm happy to come chat with them. Uh, the thing is, we take the problem, and that's it. We don't work for anyone, we're not consultants. We take the problem, and if I think my team can make a unique difference, I pay for everything, and we go and solve it for free. And our hit rate is fairly astonishingly high, I, I like to think. Uh, and if we actually come up with anything, we give it all away. Uh, it does turn out to be the worst business ever. <laughs> um, but I actually get to do an interesting thing, which is study fundamentally human things using machines. And probably the biggest example of this, in some ways, is I get to study purpose. Now, you may think, how do you study purpose using machine learning, using artificial intelligence? But let me put it this way, how do you study millions of people at the same time without it? So I get to build these little machines that observe people living their life with their permission and uh, actually observe their behaviors, not how they respond on a questionnaire, but what do they actually do? You know what's fascinating about purpose? Let me give you a definition for it. Purpose, in, to psychologists, is something that's bigger than you. Something that would take more than a lifetime to complete. And what's interesting about people in a traditional survey-based research in this space, people with a strong sense of purpose, a strong sense of life meaningfulness, is everything about their life is better. There was a great study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science uh, just this year, uh, looking at senior citizens in the UK. Uh, imagine everything you would want to be true about you, when you're a senior citizen. I see that some of you are here today. Um, and it turns out people with a stronger sense of purpose, all of these things are more likely to be true about them. Some very basic ones, like income and wealth, yes. Uh, but this is my favorite, walking speed at age 65 is higher in people with a strong sense of purpose. Um, how many friends you have, how far you go in your education, your insulin sensitivity, central body mass. Uh, again, think of any variable you would want to be true about you. 
is more likely to be true in people with a strong sense of purpose. And there's good reason to believe that this is causal. Um, so what I wanted to know is, all right, you've got a survey that tells people what purpose is. What is purpose actually expressed in someone's life? So you got this big company, and I won't tell you who they are, but this big company, about half a million people, and they let us monitor all of their employees every day, all over the world, going to work. And what behavior best correlates with purpose? Turns out, it's sacrifice. People that engage in behaviors for which they will never reap a direct benefit. Earn more money, live longer, have more friends, are happier. It's actually a bit paradoxical. I mean, it's like I'm telling you that the people that win the race are the ones that stop and help the other racers. Except, all I can say is that it's true. Um, so why is that meaningful in the grand scheme of everything I'm talking about here? Uh, it's because Sokos Labs is an experiment, itself an experiment. What if you gave it all away? Would your life be better? I live a pretty amazing life. I get to travel around the world and give talks and solve problems. Uh, I get to write books and make movies. It's crazy. I mean, really, inexplicably crazy, particularly if you knew that during the 90s I was homeless. Uh, I was supposed to, when I was very young, my uh, family was from Kansas. My dad actually was a sharecropper. I didn't even totally understand this when I was growing up. I mean, he said he was a farmer, and I thought, yeah, like, grandpa was like city council or something, right? And you owned a farm, because everyone in Kansas owns a farm. It's wheat. Um, and uh, no, it was actually, he passed away years ago. It was uh, his brother uh, at my cousin's wedding recently said, yeah, didn't, didn't you understand? Until your dad went away to university, he farmed someone else's land. Uh, and when he went away to university, he didn't go to the best possible university, even though he'd been accepted. He graduated top of his class for the entire state of Kansas after just three years. He was amazing. He was a genius. He got full scholarships everywhere, and he didn't go. Because in the words of my grandparents, what's the point? What's the point of going to some technical school, MIT, halfway across the country, when you've got KU right here. What's the point of being a smart kid on the farm? Because that's where you're going to end up back. So he went to KU, tutor Wilt Chamberlain in uh, chemistry, you know, the famous chemist. Um, and uh, if it wasn't for Vietnam, he would have had a very different life. Uh, he ended up becoming a doctor, though, and I grew up in California. And when I was little, I was going to be everything that he hadn't been. I was supposed to win a Nobel Prize. Not like crack the whip, but just, this is going to happen. And you're smart, and you're amazing, and you're white, and you live in coastal California. You have every advantage in the world. Make a difference. And the more I tried to be that person, the more everything fell apart. I mean, early. By the time I was in high school, it was nothing but struggle. Uh, and when I finally went off to university based purely on standardized test scores, I flunked out. And then I dropped out of everything. And I was homeless for many years. And I had a night with a gun, because it's America. And I spent the whole night trying to think of why I should be alive. I'd never done anything worthwhile. I'd only let people down, myself included. What's the point of any of it? And I thought of something my father used to tell me, which is live a life of substance. And I needed to put a little, some legs to that, so I transformed it to live a life that makes other people's lives better. Now, I don't mean that in some self-congratulatory sense. I mean, literally, I needed a rule to make decisions, because otherwise I should pull the trigger. I had literally been crossing off days on a calendar until this point because this was the end. Uh, so I didn't pull the trigger. I hope you had already figured that out. Um, <laughs> you're a clever crowd. I'm sure you've gotten ahead of me on that one. Um, instead, 
I worked, got a job at a convenience store. I came out, confessed to my parents that I had flunked out. Uh, I was clever enough to keep it a secret for years. Uh, I just admitted to everyone that I wasn't the person that they thought I was. And then I managed that same convenience store. And then I ran an abalone farm in Santa Cruz, California. That was, uh, I should write a book about that. It was like Lord of the Flies, but with migrant labor. Um, and then I had the chance to go back to school. Same school I'd flunked out of. And I went. Uh, and this is the one part of the story for which I cannot really give you a good reason. But I decided I'm going to do my whole degree in a single year. Uh, so, and I'm a snob, so technical degree. Math, economics, cognitive neuroscience. Those are the three that I figured out I could, I tested out a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, those are the three that I could have somehow conceivably done. Yeah, I had to take like eight, nine classes a quarter, it was a quarter system at the UCs, uh, to make it happen, but it was conceivable. So that was the plan, and I went back to school, and I got perfect scores in every class. Everything. I, did, I went from flunking out of the school to doing as well as anyone's ever done uh, at the same place, learning how to do real-time face analysis for the CIA. And then I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon and studied theoretical neuroscientists, uh, neuroscience and got fancy degrees. And then I had a joint appointment at Stanford and Berkeley. And it's worth noting that since that day with that gun, till let's say 2005, about 10 years, my life was amazing. I had papers in nature. I get talks at the most elite machine learning conferences. I was on my way to a professorship and I still hated myself. But there was something truly fundamentally important I had learned in uh, that night with the gun and the 10 years after, which is that it's not about me. And it's not about whether I'm happy. It's about whether I'm living a life that makes other people's lives better. And so I was willing to keep going. Where before, I would give up. Here, I would keep going. And I did. And um, I came out the other end, had a joint appointment at Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, my wife had a professorship there also. We started our family, and this whole other life began. Um, the reason I'm talking about this, rather than about artificial intelligence, is one, for every equation you put on the screen, half the audience goes to sleep which means two equations means everyone's asleep. Um, so uh, I've learned long ago, even to an academic audience, you don't really do a lot of justice to get too wonky. If anyone wants to ask questions, detailed questions about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep neural networks, its application, please, I'm happy to answer them. I will throw this one your way. Uh, AI cannot solve a problem you do not already know how to solve. I bet you have never heard that but it is absolutely 100% true. So if anyone is selling you a product, saying it will figure out how to do this for you, they are lying to you. AI is probably the most overhyped and underappreciated invention of all time. It is truly powerful, but the one thing it can't do is solve your problems for you. I am not Hermione Granger. Uh, I do not have a magic wand, um, but it is powerful. And it is transformative. And I've written pieces that will be coming out soon for the upcoming books on artificial intelligence and civil rights. And the fact that they may not be that compatible with one another. I've written about building my son into a cyborg. Turns out not only the diabetes, I got to build a system for Google Glass to read people's facial expressions for autistic children. To learn how to read facial expressions just by socially interacting with other people. Uh, and in fact, I have five companies now that are actively working on neurotechnologies um, for people that are locked in. They look like they're in a coma, but they're aware to allow them to communicate with the outside world. Uh, for people that have Alzheimer's, looking at phasic light treatments that actually decrease plaque loads and symptomology. And here's one of the most amazing. Everyone remember the old Simon game? It was like sets of lights and sounds, and you had to do it in a pattern. And you know, in a room like this, we get out to about six, seven, eight link sequences, and then it's hard to remember what comes next. 
so that length is often what we in psychology refer to as your working memory span, or at least one version of it. In psychology, they call that the COSI experiment. Um, well, it turns out one of my companies makes a little patch, and when you turn it on for about two hours, you're smarter. You, if you could do a seventh length sequence, now you can do a nine length sequence on average. Um, why is that important? Because it turns out that 20% increase translates into something like a $30,000 a year increase in income. It substantially increases your likelihood uh, to go advance in university or even to live longer. It turns out people with larger working memory spans have better diets for reasons which are complicated. Um, now, I'm not saying that we have invented some magic technology that truly, literally makes people smarter. But what if we go to kids with traumatic brain injuries, where one of the main symptoms is decreased working memory spans? They were in a car accident, or maybe they were beaten by their parents, or childhood household stress is a causal factor in decreasing working memory spans. We understand that at a molecular level. We do it to millions and millions of kids around the world every year, kids we love without meaning to. What if you could go to them through intensive interventions, like literacy interventions, paired with this stimulation, and give them back the pen to write their own life story? That would be amazing. And I get to do that, because I'm a crazy mad scientist. And I don't care whether it will ever make me any money. Because the idea of this experiment is live a life that makes other people's lives better. Because if you do it for that reason, your life will be better. And it turns out it's true. So in our Q&A session, which uh, I'm going to throw it over to, because genuinely, if anyone's got some wonky questions or wants to understand AI or brains, we've got some mics. I would love to answer them. But instead, I wanted to leave you with a very human message. Um, as jerks like me build AIs, not to do jobs, but to start to consume all of the rote tasks that make up most jobs. And let me tell you, I don't mean driving taxis and moving boxes around a warehouse. I don't care how much education you have. If you're doing rote work, however cognitively complex, a jerk like me already has a startup to eat that work. Now, does that mean jobs go away? No, it is, in fact, a vastly more complex story than that, good and bad. But there is one amazing silver lining to this, platinum lining to it, which is if the stuff that makes us all boringly the same is the very substance of what gets automated, then what's left is what makes us different. Literally, your value to the world is what makes you unique. Now rethink a society in which we truly celebrate what makes each of us different. That is what we bring to the world. Why train people to do what you tell them to? When I hire people at Socos Labs, I don't care whether they know how to program or know anything about brains or machine learning. It turns out advanced mathematics is harder to get later in life, but I did it. Anybody could. I mean that. I believe that. And I'm always right about everything, so there you go. Um, there's only one thing I care about when I do my interview, which is, will you have had an idea that I wouldn't have had? That's it. That's what people bring to my company and my lab. And that is the only future I want for everybody else. So we have this very scary horizon here that involves a lot of civil conflict and a lot of political disagreement, but looming over it are a lot of fears about technology and automation. And again, I wish I could give you a quick talk on that. I can't. It is so much more complex than anything you have read, good and bad. But I can tell you this, if you want an amazing life. If you want an amazing life, then give it to someone else. Thank you very much.
So I know you're used to having secretaries of state and so forth. I actually got to share a stage with Henry Kissinger once. Uh, that was fun. Um, but uh, genuinely, uh, we have some mics. Uh, I have some time. I don't really need to sleep, so we could go all night. Hi, I'm Beth Huddleston. I'm from Dallas, um, Fort Worth. And um, you mentioned something about a company that you are working on that is the Gamma Light for Alzheimer's. Yes. Um, and I was, I had heard a little bit about that on Radio Lab, one of the podcasts, and I was just wondering how far along that technology is and when we might be able to see that come to market because obviously it's a huge um, problem in this world that needs to be solved. And it sounds like you're pretty far along in it, um, or at least that technology. Yeah, so had you asked me about five years, uh, whether you could simply shine light in people's eyes and it would treat Alzheimer's, I would have said you were crazy. Um, the core work here is done by a lab at MIT. Uh, and I don't believe I use the word gamma, so you know what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. They use gamma, so this is 40 hertz, 40 times a second, the light flashes on and off. Now, mostly the reason why I'm so skeptical of the snake oil salesman is we're gonna put this into music and it will play in the background. You won't even notice it and that, eh. So what this lab does is essentially violate the Geneva Convention. Really, if you didn't have Alzheimer's, this would be torture. Large screen, this big, giant 40 hertz, full flicker, right in your face, paired with sounds. And amazingly, first in rats where they did this in an animal model, but they've been doing some human testing now, it decreases plaque codes and reduces symptomology of Alzheimer's. So uh, again, technical details, but this gamma hertz turns out a lot of activity in your frontal lobes uh, is in the same gamma range and, uh, and there's a short circuit through something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus from your optic nerve right up into those frontal lobes that appears to be what mediates this. So uh, there's the group at MIT working on their large scale, so they're working essentially on a, a headset that you wear that completely covers up. Um, the group I'm working with is at UC Berkeley and Copenhagen, interestingly, uh, and they are developing a system that in theory could be built more into commercial lighting systems. So in other words, go into a room, just sit there, read for an hour, you'd still notice it, but it wouldn't require being separated from the world for an hour. Now, if you had advancing uh, Alzheimer's or another degenerative disease, of course you'd be willing to do that. Uh, but what if there are broader sets of positive benefits? So people have looked at gamma <coughs> oscillations, gamma uh, stimulation, uh, it's something called transcranial alternating current stimulation. So what we're talking about is using light, but what many people are using is actual electrical stimulation in alternating currents uh, at a variety of different rates to treat different disorders. Uh, and there's been some amazing work, a nature paper showing that it decreases uh, symptoms of generalized dementia. So the treatments are amazing. We've seen human, but you know, it takes time for things to get into full treatment. Um, so you know, it's one of those cases where all I can say is wait, it's gonna happen. I know telling people to wait with a degenerative disease is, uh, feels like a death sentence. But um, I can say as someone on the other side with diabetes, you know, we've been telling people for, we, but scientists have been telling people for 30 years, 40 years that a cure is right around the corner. And now we're finally actually building the stuff that if not cures, make it uh, a chronically treatable, somewhat meaningless disorder. Uh, we may well get here. Alzheimer's has turned out to break a lot of hearts before, um, but the, the results are really exciting and human trials in at least three different groups are going on right now. Uh, so what are the other things that can be stimulated? And then we'll take this question. Um, uh, so I talked about working memory span. We can do that. Uh, that group is using theta oscillation. So this is about 10 hertz and it tends to synchronize activity in your frontal lobes and more posterior parts of your brain. Um, uh, two others that, huh, um, honesty. Uh, so imagine I run an experiment. I give you some dice and you roll the dice. I'm gonna pay you $10 every time you get snake eyes. Uh, but, and the great thing is you self-report. So people roll 10 times and they say, I won $50. And in your head, you lying bad, you know, <laughs> no, you did not. But it's self-report. 
And then we do a particular type of uh, gamma stimulation in a slightly other part of the frontal lobe, and they roll the dice, and suddenly their earnings are statistically probable. What's really kooky is they can lie about someone else's earnings, but not about their own. Uh, but you can also think about what this means. Uh, let's take it in two implications and then the question. One is, of course, what happens when we know we could enforce honesty on people? What happens to judicial systems? What happens in autocracies when this is something that we can actually control? Uh, one of my chief scientist jobs I was offered was, um, chief scientist for people in this case was Amazon. And it's a great story that will have to be for another time, but one of the things I would have been in charge of is making uh, large swaths of their workforce happily choose to leave after two years. Um, and yes, I believe I could do that. No, I will not do that. Uh, but interesting implications of all of that, and of course the other side is uh, what happens when the next round of ACT and SATs or GREs or any of them occur and all the rich kids have little patches on their heads that are making them smarter. Uh, well, you probably are all already aware that wealth of parents, even controlling for genetic similarity, is a causal factor in increased uh, cognitive capacity and academic output by their children. Um, what happens when we increase that by an order of magnitude? Uh, so I want some superpowers but I don't think anyone should get them if it's not a human right, so. Well, first of all, thank you for being the jerk that you described yourself as prior. Um, of all the things we've uh, heard you talk about tonight, one of the things I think I'd like to hear you expand on is CRISPR and how what you've described uh, can contribute to society and uh, the medications that you're talking about. Sure, uh, just to clarify, you said CRISPR? Correct. Yeah, so uh, as probably all of you are aware, CRISPR-Cas9 is uh, this gene editing. Uh, it's a single locus gene editing method. It's actually developed at UC Berkeley, uh, although there's some tension with some other groups about who gets the patents for it. Um, you know, it has the possibility of being transformative. But it's also kind of early in the game. There's been some work done with this, most notoriously a scientist uh, in uh, China did some editing on uh, two young girls, uh, do some work supposedly regarding AIDS. Uh, I think it's a total sham cover story because the locus he was focusing on is also known to affect cognition. Uh, that was the real reason I'm sure he was doing it. So what's interesting is, I'm gonna skip the details of CRISPR, uh, although I love geeking out about stuff like this because it's not specifically my field, but what's interesting is how machine learning transforms every other field. So people have been doing, for example, EEG, electroencephalogram, for a long time, brain waves, all the stuff I was just talking about, but before it was just noise. Uh, it was a scientific curiosity. Uh, being able to look at proteomics, or connectonomics, as it's called in neuroscience, looking at how different regions connect to each other. You just couldn't do that before. But now someone can show up with a fancy deep neural network and decode and reconstruct all of this stuff. I state again, it cannot solve a problem you do not already know how to solve. But it can transform the economics of that solution in ways which are truly transformative for the world. So before, we knew that we could do certain things. It was completely unshocking the first time someone showed that they could decode activity in your temporal lobe, auditory cortex, and actually pull out the speech that's being imagined and have a computer actually speak it. Like, that can be done already today. And it required these kinds of techniques to make it happen. And I think we'll see the same thing. I'm doing a little work in uh, looking at gender. And we're looking at genetics and hormones and epigenetics and behavior. And the only way to deal with this incredibly complex massive data is with machine learning. Uh, not because, again, it will figure out the problem for you, but because the number of variables involved, just the mass of information is simply beyond what a human can do. When I invented that system for my son, uh, I, ins 
I didn't have to truly invent anything new. I just said, what if there was an endocrinologist that followed him around 24 seven, their whole job was stare at those numbers and tweak the dials on his insulin pump in real time. And I thought, okay, that is a well-posed problem, and I built exactly that. Uh, now, if you're an endocrinologist, that might sound kind of terrifying. Uh, if you're a radiologist, it should be terrifying. Um, and some of these cases, now we're gonna leapfrog ahead, the, the pairing of computer power with data availability, with machine learning, with things like uh, genetic engineering is truly fascinating. Uh, and I think then it actually becomes a policy imperative that we start thinking about this in the same way we think about all these other things, which is, I'm saying this as a bit of an outsider, but you know, we do complex work in my field. And in 2008, when a whole bunch of people were holding up in their hands and said, how could we have ever known that our uh, financial models wouldn't hold up under strain? Well, uh, at best, it was willful ignorance. Uh, as someone that builds exactly those kinds of models, you chose not to know. Uh, how dare you have risked the entire world economy on bets you didn't understand? And I do feel the same way about genetics work. I'm not an alarmist, but we should understand this stuff and its consequences before we make germline edits that carry through some, you know, someone after they're, they're, they've moved on. Uh, but as a sci-fi geek, like, I'm all in. Let's mad scientist the hell out of all of this <laughs> stuff. I want a superpower. Um, but please make certain it's something that actually makes the world better. Yes. Actually, doctor. Yeah. I'm sorry, but. We have multiple people. And there yes, you sir. are. Sorry, okay. I didn't see you. Okay. Uh, doctor, thank you for your speech. Um, my question is, uh, my name is Edward Martins. I'm with World Boston. And um, the, the coming, I, I work for also for, uh, business development for a neur neural network company. We don't call it artificial intelligence. That scares everyone. Call it yep. intelligent assistance or machine learning. The coming intelligent assistance will seem to eliminate literally millions of jobs. Um, what do you think is coming with that? And how, how do you see that coming? And well, what can we do for those people? Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, let me start with, uh, well, let me say one thing right off the bat. One is no one has invented Skynet or anything remotely like it. We have not invented anything ever that will become smarter than we are, period. Mm. Is it possible? Theoretically, but theoretically all sorts of things can happen. Um, so let's take this off the table because there's a lot of alarmist talk about AI destroying the world. It would be us doing it, not AI. Uh, and it's powerful enough to have those sorts of concerns but worrying about building artificially intelligent demons is really shouldn't be part of our uh, discussion of policy. But this issue about jobs is a legitimate one. As in I alluded to, if people are trying to automate all of these things, and let me tell you, the sweet spot is the professional middle class. Very expensive, take a lot of education to get where you are, and yet most of us still do rote labor, right? Uh, roughly, are, are there any um, uh, flaws in this contract, uh, in this uh, bioimaging, this x-ray? Does, does this little lump here look irregular? Uh, write some boilerplate code for this programming project. Uh, we could go through any of these cases and give me a month, I could prototype something that given a year of training time, we'll do it comparable to a person. So for example, there was a competition done at Columbia recently where they took a bunch of human lawyers and a startup that built a system to read contracts. And they had a bunch of non-disclosure agreements and those non-disclosure agreements had built-in flaws. So they was designed that way. And the AI found 95% of the flaws and the humans found uh, like 88%. Whatever, they're only human. So close enough, we'll call it a tie. <laughs> Uh, the humans took 90 minutes to read each contract, the AI took 22 seconds. Oh. Uh -huh. And that was a few years ago. So I call it more like 500 milliseconds today. So now think what I said, it doesn't transform the problem, it transforms the economics. Now think through the economics of that. I don't want to get rid of all my lawyers. Somebody has to decide what to do with those flaws. AI can't explore the unknown. It is fundamentally outside of the realm of what we've built to date. 
but why am I keeping all of these people on the payroll who are just reading contracts? or writing bullet point code, or doing risk analysis off a spreadsheet, or any other incredibly complicated but rote task. All of that slowly, I am making no claims about it abruptness here, but all of that slowly goes away, largely as a function of how companies slowly roll this in as a replacement. And then we have two choices. So I'm not a futurist. I don't have any predictions to offer, but I can clearly see trends and offer you two broad choices. We build systems to make people better, or we build systems to replace people. Uh, I bet you can guess which one I like. Uh, it's the same one he was talking about. But let me be clear, that is not where we're headed, and that is not what will happen if we simply follow the same path that we've been going through all this time. Uh, Every major policy organization in the world has a paper out about the future of work. Some have several, and virtually all of them say the same thing. Uh, their generalized recommendations are upskill everyone and teach everyone how to program. If programming isn't a dead skill in 10 years, I will be shocked. I mean, I've seen the systems, actual systems, where you literally by voice describe what you want and it writes the lines of code. Uh, we've just spent five years of people telling us every kid in the world needs a program. And I'm telling you, there are craftsmen and there are tools. And while it's true that craftsmen without tools are hobbled, tools without a craftsman are pointless. Our schools and our hiring and our training has produced generation after generation of tools. And we need craftsmen. I don't know what the world would be like in 10 years. I genuinely don't. So let's build people for the unknown and let them figure out the tools that they should use to fix the problems of the future. Uh, and that means building craftsmen. So I have a whole set of answers to what building craftsmen is. I have a book coming out about it called How to Robot Proof Your Kids. Um, I'm not here to sell that, but um, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with these simple answers people have been throwing out. Okay. Okay, very quick question. You, very, you began your talk, for, so thank you so much for coming. You've really you. inspired, I think, all of us here. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you spoke about the device that you uh, designed for your son, and it's gone to Eli Lilly and other possible manufacturers. Um, are there, and I'm sure that we, like many people here, uh, have a family member who has juvenile type 1 di diabetes. Can you send us in a direction where perhaps they might participate in a trial? So there are a number of groups doing work in this space, and uh, again, Eli is the one that I know the best. Uh, we are actually building a new version. Uh, all it uses is a continuous glu glucose monitor, nothing else, no other piece of information, and we use it. So if you are the parent of someone with type 1 diabetes, um, and you watch their blood glucose throughout the day, you don't see uh, milligrams per deciliter you see the story of a little boy's life. Oh, I remember he woke up early that morning and he ate before he took any insulin and he went high through the morning and then they had to delay his lunch and then he dropped low in the end. Like you can recognize days from that one line going through it. And it's possible and this is where AI, I mean, if I was so scared of AI that I thought the answer should simply be no, I'd tell you that. What makes it complicated is it can truly do good in this world and truly do some seemingly human things, but that's because humans do it, which is, for example, learn the language of a little boy's life so it can see that trend in a given day and say, you know what, tonight he might be a little high, let's increase the basal rate. Um, so you can reach out to us uh, at socos.org and we can redirect you to other groups. Uh, there are a variety of good ones, of course, many of them the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, um, there's a group, um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on their name, but there's another one that's doing a lot of good work that's also a nonprofit that builds technology for this specific problem. Uh, and we run our own crazy experiments. Um, and, but just the opportunity to make a difference is what actually matters. So uh, again, socos.org, drop a line on our info, and uh, my team would be happy to direct you to these things. And 
Same with bipolar disorder, where we're doing a project in Parkinson's. Uh, we're doing a project uh, with kids uh, watching videos to monitor cognitive development. Uh, we are actually going to measure, this is fun, and then I'll shut the hell up. Um, <laughs> we're building a little game. This isn't medical, uh, except it is. Building a little game. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself from when you were young. And we'll predict the shows that you watched. Or tell me the shows you watched when you were young, and we'll predict things about you. What are we doing? Uh, once we have the chance to run this game for a little while, the system is then going to say, here are the five shows that had the most positive impact on you, and here's the five shows that have done the most damage. Uh, we can imagine the Kardashians are somewhere on there. So, um, but that's not the real reason we're doing it either. The real reason is because we're going to use the AI we train up off of that uh, to take screenplays and teleplays, new ones, so that it can submit it, and for free, we will make three recommendations. Here are three things that won't change the projected revenue of this project, but will have the following measurable positive impact on the kids that watch it. Just please, just make these three changes. Um, the opportunity to make thing, to do things like that uh, is powerful, and it's powerful because there's some measurable work actually done in, in Italy, as it turns out, showing uh, that the quality of television literally influences the cognitive capacity of the kids once they grow up. Um, and interestingly enough, might have been a causal factor in voting for populist candidates. Uh, <laughs> not just there. So, uh, you know, this, we have the chance to do all these amazing things. I don't care whether it's programming, I don't care whether it's machine learning, I don't care if you're starting companies or writing books or just simply telling stories. Uh, one of the best definitions ever of a purpose is the world gets better when old men plant trees. They will take an action for which they will never rest under its shade, they'll never receive a benefit. So please, tonight, go plant a tree. Thank you very much.